Hello, I'm Greg Randolph. I'd like to speak a little bit about the ATA guidelines 2015 as it relates to thyroid cancer surgery. I bring you welcome from Boston and have no disclosures. I'd like to start off looking at the new recommendations as it relates to fine needle aspiration and specifically look at some molecular options that the ATA gives us in these updated guidelines. The ATA recommends that the FNA reporting be through the Bethesda system one through six, and the molecular analysis uh, recommendations really relate to optimizing management for these three indeterminate categories, AUS plus, suspicious for follicular neoplasm and suspicious for malignancy, which can amount to up to 10 to 30% of our needle biopsy reports. Of note, there is quite a large disparity or variability in the risk of malignancy for these three indeterminate categories listed here. I'll discuss three molecular array options. The first is virocyte, which is basically the kind of genetic profile of a benign thyroid nodule. It is reported out as either benign with a very high negative predictive value or suspicious where the positive predictive value is only about 40%. So its real utility is in ruling out malignancy and avoiding surgery in a patient with a uh, indeterminate needle biopsy. The um, Again, the report uh, is uh, either written as benign or suspicious, and it performs optimally when the prevalence of malignancy in the category of needle biopsy that it's being applied to is low. The negative predictive value is preserved and high in this setting, as is shown here. But if it's applied to a category with a higher prevalence of malignancy, such as, for example, suspicious for malignancy, the rule out uh, function declines, negative predictive value declines, and its value becomes less optimal. So again, to review, a firma testing, benign nodule fingerprint, high negative predictive value, and is really optimally applied and performs best in those categories, AUS plus and follicular neoplasm, that have a low risk of malignancy, low prevalence of malignancy, and performs less optimally in suspicious for malignancy. The second molecular array option that is available now, ThyroSeq version 2, is a um, molecular analysis that includes gene mutations, uh, uh, gene fusions, and gene expression uh, RNA uh, arrays. This has been around for a shorter period of time and has been recently evaluated uh, by uh, Dr. Nikki Foroff. Um, in several different categories, I will review just its performance in the AUS plus Bethesda category. And as you can see here, its positive predictive value when positive is 76% and its negative predictive value is 96%. The final array was formerly termed Assurogen, now Thygen X, and really looks at four main oncogen oncogenes and variants of them that are present in up to 70% of thyroid cancers. This really represents a rule-in test with a high positive predictive value in, uh, in um, uh, opposition to the Affirma testing. And so you can see the specificities uh, are very high for BRAF, RET, PTC, PPAR, gamma, and high but not quite as high when RET is positive. So this is really a rule-in test. When this test is positive, the risk of malignancy is increased and so a uh, standard thyroidectomy with or without central neck dissection can be offered for a more definitive diagnosis of thyroid malignancy. All of these tests have their financial uh, implications that vary geographically and based on insurance carrier. Let's look briefly at what the ATA has recommended as options for these molecular tests. And, uh, recommendation 15 describes that for AUS plus, it really just represents an option. The alternative would be repeat needle biopsy or surveillance or a diagnostic surgical excision. So lots of options are available, but one of them now becomes molecular assessment, a high negative predictive value that comes back, a high negative predictive value test that comes back benign allows you the option of surveillance. Similarly, for the follicular neoplasm category, molecular testing is also used 
as an optional, optional supplement to work up, but the recommendations clearly uh, state that if molecular testing is either not performed or inconclusive, that surgical consider, uh, excision can be considered as uh, it has been before the advent of molecular testing for this category. For suspicious for papillary carcinoma, the recommendation is surgical management would be similar to that if it came back diagnostic for malignancy, but if the patient is hesitant to move forward with a total thyroidectomy in that setting, molecular testing uh, for the oncogene panel could be considered to increase the risk of malignancy and to move forward with surgery with that additional optional information. One possible algorithm that these tests can be utilized is for the lower prevalence of malignancy categories, AUS plus and follicular neoplasm, a high negative predictive value test such as the Affirma or ThyroSeq test can be offered. If negative, then surveillance without surgery can be considered, and if positive, a lobectomy can be provided. Whereas in a higher prevalence of malignancy category like suspicious for malignancy, if the surgery was not planned based on that alone to be a total, then an oncogene panel test can be offered, and if negative, a lobectomy can be performed, and if positive, a total thyroidectomy. Again, both of these uh, options for molecular testing can be altered depending on the desire for surgery, the desire for total thyroidectomy, and other clinical parameters that help to predict the prevalence of malignancy in that specific population, including age, presence of vocal cord paralysis, presence of malignant uh, findings uh, suggestive on ultrasound, or history of radiation therapy. I'll move forward now to the degree of thyroid surgery as indicated by the ATA 2015 guidelines, and there has been a pendulum swing towards more conservative surgery. 35A suggests that for large uh, lesions greater than 4 centimeters or patients with extrathyroidal extension or clinically apparent nodal disease or distant metastasis, surgical procedure is optimally offered as a bilateral, typically total, thyroidectomy. But recommendation 35B notes that for lesions that are appropriately selected between one and four centimeters, as long as there is no extrathyroidal extension and as long as there are no clinical evidence of nodal metastasis, then a unilateral procedure can be considered. Again, this is uh, the implication is that this is thoroughly discussed with the patient and those involved, typically endocrinology, in the patient's postoperative follow-up. The factors supporting a more conservative and uh, often unilateral surgery for lower to intermediate risk patients is recent data demonstrating that improperly selected patients' clinical outcomes are similar for unilateral versus bilateral surgery. Also, a trend towards more selective application of radioactive iodine in patients to low to intermediate risk who may not need total thyroidectomy to facilitate the subsequent radioactive iodine. And again, that the local regional recurrence rate is quite low um, with uh, uh, unilateral surgery um, uh, and so this pendulum swing towards a consideration for more conservative surgery in these patients. For patients with microcarcinomas without extrathyroidal extension, the initial surgical procedure for those that are planning to have um, uh, surgery uh, is a, a unilateral procedure. BRAF analysis, because of the overall low positive predictive value in predicting recurrence, uh, is not routinely recommended for the titration of initial surgical or nodal treatment in isolation in patients with DTC. I'd like to move on now to the uh, preoperative analysis for nodal disease and focus briefly on the concept of macro versus micrometastasis. We are familiar that the major uh, that uh, up to 35 percent uh, of patients in the adult group. Uh, presenting with thyroid cancer present with clinically apparent nodal disease uh, prior to surgery. Clinically apparent, this concept of macroscopic nodal disease that includes those nodes that are detected as normal on the physical exam, on preoperative radiographic analysis, including ultrasound and perhaps CT scan, and those that are identified as grossly abnormal at surgery. Clinically apparent nodal disease. We know from a number of studies that the rate of microscopic nodal disease, that which is clinically inapparent, can range from 23 to up to 81% in these nine studies. 
And so macrometastasis in about a third, micrometastasis in some higher percentage of patients. And so the recommendation uh, 36 is that prophylactic central neck dissection, that is those without clinically apparent disease, can be considered in uh, advanced primary tumors, T3 or T4, those with clinically involved lateral neck nodes, or those in whom the information of prophylactic neck dissection would be felt to be useful in terms of planning additional steps in treatment, and that the prophylactic neck dissection for patients with lesser, smaller tumors, non-invasive, uh, can be, and for most follicular cancers, can be avoided. The prognostic significance of nodal metastasis relates in part to the size of the node, and so when we look at clinical N0, microscopically positive and macroscopically positive, the rates of nodal recurrence really diverge significantly with the real clinically significant nodal disease being restricted to macroscopic nodal disease. And so the argument for prophylactic central neck dissection for staging is um, uh, problematic in that if the patient is microscopically upstaged by prophylactic neck dissection, these patients, there is controversy as to whether that information actually warrants additional radioactive iodine treatment, whereas if the central neck dissection is done and is negative, radioactive iodine is not given, and that is to patients in whom radioactive iodine would not have been given anyway. So the actual utilization of prophylactic central neck dissection for staging is somewhat problematic. In terms of how do you assess for macroscopic clinically apparent nodal disease, the suggested preliminary rec um, uh, definition is that which I've outlined. Those nodes identified by physical exam, radiographic, or intraoperative inspection. What does the 2015 guidelines say about this? Well, preoperative neck ultrasound, that is not just thyroid, but nodal neck ultrasound is required in all patients. There has been also a pendulum swing from the 2009 guidelines, which basically prohibited uh, CT scanning or axial scanning in the majority of patients. So there's been a pendulum swing back towards a more liberal acceptance in recommendation 33 for the use of cross-sectional imaging in patients who have clinical suspicion of advanced primary disease, including invasive primary tumor, or clinically apparent multiple or bulky nodal involvement. So it's a combined, in that subset of patients, a combined ultrasound and CT scan map is considered. CT scan finds a disease that the ultrasound may not find and is repeatable and is again recommended for nodal disease that is advanced, such as this the lateral and central neck nodal disease, really large, bulky nodal disease, which not, might not be completely uh, thoroughly assessed with ultrasound. We have found in our study, looking at 162 patients in the primary and revision setting, that the addition of CAT scan correctly identified locations of macroscopic nodal disease that were not always indicated by ultrasound in a substantial fraction of patients. So the idea the ATA is moving forward with is a very high acuity a uh, focused preoperative nodal map which guides compartmental dissection at surgery in those areas of significant nodal disease. And so those compartments that are mapped out as having suspicious uh, nodes are dissected, and those compartments that are absent of this disease are maintained without dissection. Again, the contrast enhanced CAT scan requires coordination with postoperative uh, radioactive iodine treatment. I'd like to now finish with a short section on surgical uh, complications, focusing really mainly on the recurrent laryngeal nerve as it relates to the guidelines. The first is that the guidelines recommend that prior to surgery there be communication regarding surgical risks, mainly nerve and parathyroid, through the informed consent process to patients. All patients undergoing thyroid surgery recommendation 40 of the 2015 guidelines note should have voice evaluated prior to their uh, uh, surgical intervention. This is an, a matter of eliciting from the patient historical correlates of voice disturbance and of noting the patient's voice during your physical exam. 
Uh, this can be with an instrument of voice uh, assessment or just through gross clinical assessment during this evaluation. But the point is voice is part of the thyroid cancer preoperative surgical evaluation. Recommendation 41 notes that laryngeal exam should be performed on patients who have voice abnormality based on your previous voice evaluation. On patients who have had previous cervical or upper chest surgery that places the RLN or vagus at risk, whether their voice is normal or not during your evaluation. And then finally, for patients with thyroid cancer with known extrathyroidal or suspected extrathyroidal posterior extrathyroidal extension or extensive central neck nodal metastasis. Postoperatively, all patients should have their voice assessed and laryngeal exams should be performed in those where the voice is judged to be normal, judged or reported to be abnormal. Again, the importance of voice evaluation laryngeal exam is this uh, link between invasive thyroid cancer and vocal cord dysfunction. In terms of neural monitoring, the American Academy of Laryngology has recently published a guideline as it relates to voice management perioperatively, and their recommendation is intraoperative EMG monitoring is an option uh, for the patient uh, uh, undergoing thyroid surgery, and their recommendations is that there may be special utility in monitoring in cases of bilateral thyroid surgery, revision thyroid surgery, and surgery in the setting of an existing preoperative vocal cord paralysis. The ATA Guidelines 2015 has weighed in here and has made a recommendation 42 that visual identification of the recurrent laryngeal nerve is required in all cases and steps should be taken to preserve the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. And then 42B, that neural monitoring with that neural stimulation with or without monitoring may be considered to facilitate nerve identification and concern and confirm nerve function. We've recently published a, a corridor of normal normative EMG data that will allow you to predict with good sensitivity postoperative glottic function as is depicted here. This is the between the 5th and 95th percentile of normative EMG in those patients who had normal vocal cord function postoperatively. You satisfy these criteria and you can operate on the second side knowing that the first nerve will function. I'd like to end by, again, inviting you for some upcoming educational uh, experiences. The annual meeting of the American Academy of Otolaryngology will be held next September 2016 in San Diego. Our Harvard Thyroid and Parathyroid Surgical course will be November 4th and 5th, 2016. And the Third World Congress on Thyroid Cancer, the end of July 2017. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Wish you well in the conduct of the first Congress of the APTS. Thank you.